So there we go. You've got me. Uh, I've got a great big rambling presentation, but you know, don't worry too much. There's a lot of pictures. Uh, when I was talking to the uh, livestock, uh, uh, sorry, the LiveX staff, uh, I said uh, they said try and use a lot of pictures. This lot are better with pictures. And I, I, I didn't fully understand what they meant, but you know, I just do what I'm told, frankly. It's, uh, so off we go. Uh, lots to get through. Uh, uh, population of the world. Eight million. Well, we can do a reverse. Uh, uh, you know, let's, let's let's start a little lower. Low. It's about seven point eight billion. You know, is that, is that a lot? Do you think that's a lot? You know, that's seven thousand eight hundred million. Uh, if I went back, I don't know, forty odd years ago, my wife Susan and I emigrated to Canada in August nineteen seventy three, and the population of the world in seventy three was about. 3.8 billion. So in my professional lifetime, the population of the world has, has doubled. I might say we added another two. We were rather pleased with that, and the, the, the kids have stumped up five. So you know, we've done our bit, frankly. Uh, but what I do remember, I was a food policy analyst when I first moved to, to, to Canada. And the view was that we were not going to be able to feed this anticipated uh, doubling of the population. And the fact of the matter that we have, that the proportion of people who are malnourished has gone down. There's still 800 million who wake up and go to bed hungry, which is unacceptable. Uh, but there's been an astonishing response from the world agricultural community to feed more. And what's more, we're going to add another 2 billion. And, uh, you know, and again, I hear the, the stories, oops, we're not going to manage. And I think we probably will. But so let's just get into it, if I can. Uh, Help me at the back if I can't. Yeah, there we go. So what I say is, are we going to spread these extra 2 billion that we're going to get now over the next 20, 30 years evenly across the, uh, the globe? And the answer is no. If you look at this sort of uh, big uh, graph here, what do we see? That, uh, I'm very Africa positive. I lived in Africa for five years. Uh, it's got a population of about a billion. And over the next 20 or so years, it's going to double to 2 billion. And I wonder, for the world, is that sort of a brilliant food marketing opportunity, or will it bring social problems, or will it be some combination of both? Probably so. So let's take this two billion, and if I uh, look at it from a religious perspective, then 1.5 billion of the two billion will either be Hindu or Muslim by religion. Now, is that just sort of interesting cocktail chat, or might that have some sort of implications for the food industry. What do you think? I mean, it looks pretty good, half of them at least, for you guys. I mean, it doesn't look brilliant for the pork guys. <laughs> no, you know, no, 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 they're probably, no, oops, you know, there we go. So these sort of big changes in the great scheme of things have huge implications for all of us in the food industry, not least in livestock and meat, I would, I would suggest. What else have I got here? Uh, US. The U.S., I'm Canadian as well as a, a, a Brit, U.S., Canada, and Mexico, population's going to grow by, what, the better part of over 100 million over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. That's a lot. Uh, but here we are, what about the EU? And let's, for the moment, anyway, just for the moment, consider that the U.K. is still in the EU. It will be for another four or five weeks, probably. There we go. Well, maybe until January 31. Uh, but actually, the European EU population will decline slowly over time, as indeed will Russia. Uh, that's largely vodka-driven, actually. <laughs> but, but if you take Japan, which is a, uh, a great market for you in history, certainly for uh, uh, you know, premium uh, meat products, uh, population of Japan, the guy down the front was quite good at this. 126, 127 million. And if you take official sort of government statistics from Japan, then they're losing a million per year each year. And so if you sort of fast forward about 25 years, the expectation is that the population of Japan will be 100 million. Now, can you imagine operating, from a food industry point of view, operating in a market where every year the market gets smaller? That's why I see around the world Japanese food companies looking for emerging markets where there's growth. What else have I got here? Uh, oh, OK. Uh, what about uh, Vietnam and Indonesia, which are two markets which are particularly uh, good for you? Um, Indonesia population, we all know this, you've got on in Indonesia. Sorry? 267 million, that's pretty exact, isn't it? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and okay, give me Vietnam while you're at it. Uh, get yeah, 98 something. And what's going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years there? You're going to see strong growth in Indonesia, uh, but more modest growth in Vietnam, where the fertility rate actually is surprisingly low. A bit like Thailand. You know, you take Thailand, where the population is static to declining as you move forward. I mean, who'd have thought? So, hang on. This uh, next one on. But this sort of intrigues me. Uh, if you look at the median age of continents, okay, so that is the, in, in, it's, it's sort of like the, the average, but it's, median is, there's the same number one side as the other. And if you look at, uh, what are you, 37, that's the median age for uh, Australia. Uh, compare that with Japan, where it's 47. Okay, so Japan, uh, apart from Monaco, is one of the oldest uh, countries in terms of age. Uh, so what, again, is that just sort of, you know, interesting cocktail conversation? Well, no, what happens as you get older, and I've got direct experience of this, I might tell you, is that you eat less and you eat less meat. So you've got, in Japan, you've got a declining population and it's getting older, and you can see that meat market just being squeezed. Uh, but if I take your two big markets of Indonesia and uh, Vietnam, then they're roughly around 30. So that's, it's relatively young. But look at Africa, which I think is frightening. So the median age in Africa is 18. And so what? You know, why would we worry about that? I mean, first of all, it means they're going to have plenty of labor, but 18 uh, tells me that it better go right on that continent. And if they don't get economic growth, you're going to have a huge number of young people, of which 50% will be male, who will probably be grumpy. And they'll probably walk. And so if we think we've had an immigration crisis in Europe, for example, or anywhere else in the world, all I'd say is, you just watch out. If we fast forward 10, 15 years, and if we don't see the growth in, in Africa, then we'll have an immigration crisis writ large. And that won't be an African problem. That will be a global problem. I think we've got to be a little bit more grown up about immigration because I see it coming to uh, in other parts of the world. Let me just sort of quickly move on. Here we go. So last year, I was just, uh, you know, I have to read in my business. Um, I do it on your behalf, by the by. And so FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, put out this sort of map, which was their view on the impact of climate change over the next and up to about 2050. And any country with, which is greenish, their view would be that climate change will have a neutral to, in some cases, even slightly positive effect. But if it's red or pinkish, it'll be the other way around. I still haven't worked out why the entire Australia is green, but that's, that's, that's another matter. Let's just sort of park that. But what sort of concerned me was that when I looked at that map, the areas which are red or pinky are the areas where you're going to get the population growth. And that tells me that food security in those countries is probably going to be unstable. And then from your point of view, though, I suggest that there's clearly huge opportunities, market opportunities. So there we go. The, on the right-hand side, that's just a, uh, a little graph of what's happened over the last 20 years or so, seven, 26 years, in terms of average global sea level rises. And what it tells me is that the uh, average sea level globally has risen by about 10 centimeters over the last 25 years. That's not a lot, but it's over a relatively short period of time. And again, if I look at some of those red areas, let's take uh, the Asian subcontinent, let's take Bangladesh. Hang on, population of Bangladesh in the front, please. You're less good on Bangladesh on account of you not selling a lot of meat, and nor are you going to, as they're all vegetarian, but that's another matter. It's, let's say 170 million, of which 40% of that country is at or below sea level. Now, what do you think is going to happen over the next 25 years if you get another 10 centimetres of sea rise? They're going to walk. And again, they'll, they'll be coming down your way too. So again, from an immigration point of view, there's going to be some big issues coming our way, I would suggest. Moving on. And interestingly enough, that as we see this population expanding, increasingly people live in cities. 
and what's more in megacities. But from a trade policy point of view, governments tend to think about from uh, national to national, from country to country, the market in China, the market in Indonesia. But I think as we move forward increasingly, it will be about mega cities. So we've got 196 countries, but we're moving towards a position where we'll have 600 or so mega cities. I mean, let's take Jakarta being one. Greater, greater Jakarta, population 30 million. Three zero million, there's more people in Jakarta than there is in Australia, for goodness sake. And I think that it's good because they're great targets, I would suggest. Moving on, I've got to be quick here. There we go. And interesting enough, so I have to read, and every January, the, the couple on the right, who you might recognize, no? The Gates, the Gates, the Gates man and boy, uh, and they write a letter to the world. That's very civil of them. And uh, in this January, the, the, these little, again, cocktail facts, we'll build an entire New York City every month. What they're saying is that the expansion of major cities, of cities in general, is at such a rate, over the next 40 years, it's equivalent that every month we'll build another New York City. Just think about that. And, and again, it was sort of interesting cocktail park, but then I thought, I wonder what the impact of that is on agriculture. You can just see, we've got, we're running out of land to an extent, and each year we're going to take more and more and put it into cities. And I think that will bring its own challenges too. And interesting enough, I have thought that cities were going up, but they're spreading horizontally, just taking more and more land. Here we go. And if we take China, just a quick few seconds on, on, on China, it's a sort of classic in terms of big cities. Because if you take the top tier of Chinese cities, let's take the top 10, then the, the gross domestic product, the economic clout of cities in, in China, the big cities, are the same as countries. So Shanghai has the same GDP economic clout as the Philippines, a country with 105, 110 million people. Let's go all the way down to Chengdu, and I'm sure many of you have been to Chengdu, which is the capital of Sichuan province, you know, where you get the wonderful spicy peppery peppery food, that has an economic clout the same size as Norway, and you'll be delighted to hear this, twice the size of New Zealand. You know, the New Zealanders are always so slightly up themselves. <laughs> but they had a comeuppance just last week. That's, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's by, by the by. <laughs> so, so you've got some Chinese cities with purchasing powers of, of, of countries. And again, they pr provide great targets because they've got pretty decent marketing infrastructure in there. But what we've got to watch is we don't become uh, over-reliant on China. China's so big and it's been growing so quickly that whatever they elect to eat more or less of has a huge influence on demand and supply globally. And we're seeing that right now. I'll come on to it with regard to pork. So I just took... You know, so, for example... Uh, you know, if they fall out with the Americans on trade and American food products can't get into China, suddenly you think, my Lord, you know, the world is our oyster from your perspective. But then suddenly that changes. Or what happened if we went back a few years ago, President Xi looked at those who were managing large state corporations and said, have smaller lunches. You know, you're spending too much of the state money on big fancy lunches. And so they, they, they do what they're told. And what happened? That abalone and fine wine exports from Australia to China collapsed. So whatever they do has a disproportional influence. So let's say they decide, well, take pork, okay, which is you know, their crisis at the moment. If they're consuming 1 kg less per person, that's 1.3 million tonnes. So you know, if they say, well, well, let's eat beef instead, well, that means you've got to stump up 1.3 billion tonnes extra of beef. And so it's sort of brilliant if it's going in your direction, but then it can really sort of crucify you if it goes in the other direction, which we saw, for example, with dairy, where suddenly they turned off imports of uh, milk powder and the market crashed globally. So they can make or break you. And looking forward, what do I see? That you can see their economic growth rate going down and things will start to change. We've, we've become sort of... It's a bit addictive, you know, it's that sort of China heroin that we just sort of get addicted to it, and then suddenly we're over-reliant on it, I would suggest. 
And look at this. I mean, it's a bit sort of fancy, but if you take the, uh, where am I, the left-hand side, that's the demographic pyramid profile of Japan. And what does it show you is that there are many more old people than there are young people, which is slightly worrisome. You know, who's going to do the work, for example? Well, robotics, perhaps. So that's what it's like in Japan now. On the right-hand side, that's what it's going to be like in China in another 10 years' time. So because of the one-child policy in China, the Chinese will get old before they get rich, with all the consequential social problems associated with that. So I think, you know, we've got this sort of rosy view, great growth in China, et cetera, but it will moderate, and we'll have to... We don't want to be overly China-dependent, uh, I would suggest. Moving on. But then, if we look at Asia in general, which is a sort of brilliant market for you, uh, I'm always intrigued by how food culture, food heritage, food traditions, and food practice is so different from our own. So, for example, what have we got here? That's a kitchen in any apartment in China or in many big Asian cities. And I'm, when I'm working with food companies, particularly meat companies, I'm saying, there's the kitchen, there are two gas rings, there's a, probably a rice cooker, which will be separate. You know, there's no oven, for goodness sake. Can they use your product in that kitchen? I think it's a good start to understanding food culture. Just, just go into the kitchen and have a look around. And then, you know, what about putting a meal together? We all know how Australians, Brits, Americans put a meal together. What you do is start with a plate and preferably a big one. And then in the middle, <coughs> you put a great walloping piece of meat. And then boop, 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 you dot around it the sort of things your mother would be proud of, your little bits of green here and there. And that, that's mine. It's not yours, it's mine. And I'm going to eat all of it. Because remember the starving of Africa. And I've never fully got the link between me finishing my broccoli and the starving. But that's another one. Yeah. <laughs> So, but here, typical, here I was with my interpreter in uh, Hangzhou in China, and uh, we're sitting down with her family, small family, and there are eight, nine dishes, something like that. There's a bit of this, a bit of that. They are in, in, intrinsically flexitarian. There's vegetables, there's meat, there's different colours, et, 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 et cetera. It's so, so different. And again, can my product be used in that context? Uh, last week, coming here, I just stopped in Bangkok, and I was in a small a local restaurant uh, by myself, and in next door, five people turned up, and what did they have here? They had something like 15 different plates. That's like between five, three, and it wasn't three each. Everything is shared. There's no concern about double dipping. It's so, so different. And yet you've got to understand that food culture and heritage if you want to understand the market, I would suggest. And then again, what they value changes too. So here I am in Nanjing. Um, on the left, is it? Yeah, on your left hand side, that's boneless, skinless chicken breast at 9 RMB for 500 grams. And on the right hand side, chicken wings at 24 RMB for 500 grams. What would it be in Australia? The other way around. And so I was doing some work for Cargill China, who make the McNuggets. For McDonald's there, great business they're having at the moment. And they said, yeah, and what's more, we've got a brilliant export business to, to China. I said, what for? Chicken. Chicken? I didn't even know they had a license. Who's the, uh, the customer? It's Nestle. I said, Nestle? What do Nestle do with chicken? I said, well, they put it in their premium cat food. That's chicken breast. So if your children or grandchildren are visiting Europe and they're a bit peckish of an evening, then you know, just... <laughs> Just rip the top off a can of Felix or whatever it is, or whiskers. And, you know, or again, uh, I mean, we don't fully understand this, or I don't. I was working in the uh, Pearl Delta region, southeast uh, China, and my interpreter, at the end of a long day, I said, I'll get the beer. She said, I'll go and get some snacks. And she went off to get the snacks, and as she came towards me, she looked at me sort of a bit sheepishly and said, David, I don't know if you're going to like this. And I said, you're right there, honey. And it, uh, 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 but then she said, because you might find it a little spicy. And I thought, oh, oh right, yeah, okay. Good enough. Yeah. There we go. 
Or, or Malaysia, I was in Kuala Lumpur just very recently, where the fish head, what is it, eight, nine dollars for a fish head. And, you know, again, from a Brit point of view, we like fish, but we only like fingers. And, and, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all we want. You know, it's different, these cultural differences. And this has already been addressed, really, but uh, I was a uh, PhD external examiner for a, a, a Malay uh, Muslim woman from Curtin University in WA, and she was looking at factors influencing Malaysian shoppers' decision to purchase beef. And I'll just pick the top one. And all her research showed, which is exactly what MLA, et cetera, and the, the, all of you guys know, that actually the number one matter for Malays is the confidence in the halal process, the level of shopper trust in where they're buying meat. It was sort of really intriguing. And that actually, I thought, was good from a live point of view because it suggested that they had more trust, well, they certainly had more trust in the wet market in a butcher that they knew that they could relate to than a supermarket which was more amorphous and they really didn't trust. But again, you know, it depends where you are in the world, what are the drivers of demand, and clearly that's a huge driver in Malaysia. Oop. There we go. Okay, quickly, uh, this is sort of brilliant news, isn't it? This is rubber bank information. What does it show that worldwide 35% more demand for animal protein in the next 20 years? Great! And what's more, beef isn't the fastest growing, but it is growing. But overall, you can see this growth. What's the fastest growing? It's poultry, to a lesser extent, eggs, uh, seafood, etc. Et so, you know, great. That as you, we look forward, overall, the substantial global growth in protein. Brilliant. Where's most of the growth? Oh, my word, it's in your region. Something like 65% of the expected total growth is coming up in countries which are already your markets. Uh, but then you can see this sort of disproportional influence of China. Where it, what's next? Well, Indonesia, great. Vietnam is in there too. So great news for you. The little clouds you can see are those countries where right now African swine fever is an issue. And I'll come back to that. So, I mean, it looks, it looks so bright. It's sort of brilliant for you. Very proud for you. But then look at this whole African swine fever uh, problem in China. Boss hog, as it says here. This is, you can see that China consumes something like 50% of all the world's pork. And their herd has been decimated, some would say, by 40%. There's a problem there, a huge problem, which brings an opportunity, I would suggest. We go. So that's what's happened to prices. Suddenly, whew, I was just talking to a friend in uh, Xiamen in China two days ago, and uh, she was saying, "What's happening, David? The price of pork has gone to you know three times was what it was a, a, a year ago." And why is that important in China? Because pork is like rice. I was interviewing again ladies who were shopping in wet markets, in traditional markets in, in China, I said, what will happen? What happens if the price of pork doubles? Do you buy less pork? And they looked at me and said, pork is like rice. You know, it's a staple. But you can see now, we've take, you take that amount of protein out of China, then we'll have reverberations around the meat world for how long? Well, the rubber bank view is for the next five years for five years for them to actually come to terms with the problem they've got and then to rebuild, etc. Will that bring opportunities? Yes, it will. It'd be really interesting to see what they buy instead of pork, because they can't all be buying this pork if they're 30% less or 40% less. I think they'll probably go more for the cheapest protein they can get hold of, and that would tend to be chicken, which is not a great favoured meat in China, and maybe fish, but I'll come back to that in a second. Oh. So, China pork's uh, price surged towards $8 uh, a kilo as demand picks up. But if you look at the detail there, if you can, it's had an impact on all meat prices in China. Beef prices up, lamb prices up, chicken prices up. And in fact, around the world too, I was talking in Copenhagen about two or three weeks ago at the International Egg Conference. You know, do I need to get out more? Probably not. And, 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 and what they were identifying there was that spent hens, so that 
hens which had finished their egg-laying days, which then go into sort of chicken meat for soups, etc., the price has gone way up. So this, this sort of problem in China is going to have a sort of push upwards price on all meats around the world. But look, this, I've been using this for ages, but for, when I think about what is, if I look in the great world of meat in its widest sense, where's the battleground? Where's the ear-pulling, eye-gouging, thumping uh, battle? And it's between industrially produced chicken and industrially produced fish. And why is that? Well, what sort of fish? It's tilapia, it's pangasius, which I've forgotten what you call in. Do you call it bassa? Do, you, do we know that? You know, the, the interesting thing, people in the red meat industry don't count fish as meat. Yeah, but, but don't worry, fish people don't count you either. So it's, you know. But you've got this great big battle because those will be the lowest priced proteins on the market. You can't compete with that because if you try to, you'll get your clocks wiped. Incidentally, what it says here is that the biggest meat, well, it's, it's because I say it, the biggest meat is fish and seafood. We don't tend to think that, but that's the largest proportion of total meat globally is fish and seafood. That's another method. Don't forget about it. So wherever I go in the world, here's white fish fillet, which is uh, Pangasius bassa from Vietnam, uh, competing head to head with, this is skin on, but bone out chicken breast. At three bucks a kilo US uh, in Mexico, in this particular case. Uh, and I think that that's the lowest end of the market. And that's where people who are short of money migrate to. And to, to one extent or another, you have to compete with them. OK. But the intriguing thing is, I'm sure you're saying to yourself, what is going on in the so called mature economies, the Western world, etc.? Because if you follow the media, the suggestion is uh, that we're all turning vegetarian. I mean, it's these trackers. Uh, in the US, however, and, in, and to some extent in Europe, still 80, 90% of people consider that they're, they're meat eaters, full on meat eaters. But let's go in. But in the, uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, meat eating frequency is down, meat consumption is down. Uh, and what about, and I saw this came out yesterday. Uh, what about in Australia? Surely, you know, in Australia, you have a hundred, you, you eat 106 kilos of meat, including fish per capita. I mean, how you've got the time to be sitting listening to me, I don't know. You should be at home gnawing on the rear end of a large steer. Uh, but it, seemingly in Australia, too, there are issues related to that the, the middle class, perhaps, um, even some say the uh, overeducated elite, are electing to eat less meat, and they're talking about plant protein. Why do they eat less meat? Health is the number one reason. Health being that there is a perception that if you eat too much red meat, then it's poor for your health. And this sort of is the pressure point, I would suggest, for the meat industry, whatever part you're in over the next uh, few years, well, actually, probably 20 years, which is the pressure points is on the environment and the impact of your industry, on human health, and on animal welfare. And we're going to have to come to terms with this. And who's driving this? I think increasingly it's actually they're in your families and they're your children or your grandchildren. And what I see emerging is this, and I think it'll be just like a mega trend, is this increasing concern about the impact of food production on our world, climate change, the environment, etc. And we're seeing emerge this view that we ought to have climate-friendly diets. And I don't think that's a fad. I think it's going to be a, just a mega deal. I can see it in my own family. Uh, here we go. There's two uh, little girls here who are my gra uh, grandchildren. Scarlett at the top. I was just looking at her. Hey, she gets a comic on a Saturday. And it is first news. It's sort of an upmarket comic. Are your trainers costing the earth? But here she is. She's nine. And she's right into this, the impact on whatever I eat, whatever I wear on the environment. Down on the right, Seraphine, she's a nightmare. You know, you know, you can't eat anything without being quizzed about it, particularly me because I'm supposed to know something about food. And that's where the driver is, and I just see that getting heavier duty. Uh, so what do we see? Uh, here we are on the BBC online in the UK. This is the schools use this. How does your food choice impact on the environment? How often do you eat beef? I put this in into the machine. 
one to two times a week. That's the equivalent of driving a regular petrol car 2,500 2, kilometers. What about chicken? Well, the impact there would be just a minimal uh, 440 kilometers. Mind you, if we just had peas, God forbid, and then that's equivalent to six kilometers. So there's this sort of focus on what's the impact on the environment. I have to move on. And then, doesn't this get up your nose? Here's Lewis Hamilton, who's a lovely driver, who's, who's gone vegan, and now sort of uh, trying to get us all to go. This, and it's not as if he's Mr. Eco-friendly, is he? You know, driving a... <laughs> you know, but he did, he did sell his plane. But you can see it happening, and look at the impact it's having on the food industry, for goodness sake. Uh, and here, the New Zealand's in the dairy industry, that the uh, Minister of Ag telling that the New Zealand farmers, cut your carbon emissions, or we will tax you. This is coming, and it's coming at speed. What about health? Well, it's, I'm intrigued here, I'm Canadian. Look at this, spot the red meat. This is Health Canada saying, this is what you should eat. Just up on the top right, you can just see a little speckle of red meat. The livestock and meat guys, they weren't well pleased in Canada. Uh, here we are in Belgium, just pick some countries, really at random. They're, every single mature economy has the equivalent of this. Red meat is somewhere down the bottom where it says, eat less. And for the poor pork guys, for bacon, never, ever pick it up or you'll die. <laughs> Same in the UK, you know, try and find the red meat. It's very, very difficult. Then there's the whole animal welfare issue, and you know this writ large, don't you? Look at the impact of the petters of this world. They're relentless, they're zealous, and they're well financed. Uh, on the top, I'm me, not meat. So reminding that if you eat meat, then you're eating an animal that, uh, you know, is sentient etc. Uh, and you have these issues, you're going to have to handle it because it's not going to get less. It will get more. It, they, they are relentless. Uh, and this sort of thing in Australia doesn't help matters. You know, it's not related to you, but it just doesn't help matters. Here we go. And so what's happened out in the, uh, the world, back on this sort of cutting back on, on meat, here we've got Meat companies suddenly saying, well, let's go flexitarian. This is a little bit of meat and a little bit of vegetables, and we'll mix them together. Purdue, one of the major chicken companies in the world. Uh, what's the one on the right? Is it Hormel? Uh, yeah, Hormel, which is Spam, for God's sake. What about here? Tyson, again, one of the, the world's great meat companies, unleashes uh, their plant-based meats with new products. Raised and rooted, which is, again, a mixture of beef and vegetable. Is it, are they good products? They're bloody good products. Uh, Tyson into uh, shrimp-type products made from plants. Uh, here we are. The other day I was in Boston with Smithfield, which is owned by the WH Group, which is the largest pig pork company in the world, and they just launched their own soy-based, grown on the farm, not in a lab. Uh, here's JBS, the largest meat company in the world, with their own plant equivalents. Something's going on here. What about across Europe? Uh, I was in Italy just three weeks ago, and I thought, the Italians have such a strong culture, surely they won't be into this. Yes, they are, writ large. Plant-based meats, popular in Germany. The French, for God's sake, flexitarian French, where does it end? Uh, and then there's corn, which is a mycoprotein again, which is now owned by uh, Monde Nissen from the Philippines. It'll be the first billion-dollar turnover a uh, global brand for a non-meat meat, if you'll allow me to say that. And then look what's happened over the last... This is this year, since January. OK, let's go through some of the bigger fast food companies. You've got the Vegan Beyond Burger for Carl Juniors, which you have in a a Australia. One. Two. Beyond Meat Burger in A&W, uh, right across North America. Three. McDonald's launches meaty big vegan burgers in Germany. Who's making them? Nestle. Uh, here, back to Canada, uh, can I have a PLT, please? Not a BLT, a, P a plant lettuce and tomato. McDonald's test plant-based burger in Canada. The Impossible Whopper, no percent, 100% Whopper, 0% beef. Uh, meaty vegan garlic wrap from Subway. Uh, McDonald's in the UK, the first ever vegetarian happy meal for kids. Uh, for God's sake, here's the, the bloody colonel. <laughs> you know... Uh, with his non-chicken chicken nuggets. <laughs> and Pizza Hut just testing plant-based incognito sausage toppings in the round. But, and who makes incognito? Kellogg's. Kellogg's, the cereal guys, because they're doing so badly in breakfast cereals, they're going to pretend meats. 
And is it just sort of uh, peculiar, mature economies? No, I see this happening across uh, um, a Asia too. Here's future, future foods creating a plant-based pork substitute for the Asian market. Jackfruit, which mimics pork brilliantly. Uh, that's by the by. And then, of course, I haven't even mentioned this cell-based stuff, uh, which, will it be a big deal in the market? Well, not in my lifetime. And again, I'm not in the first flush of youth, but I can see this 15 years down the road. It, it will have its place in the market. Uh, who's into it? Cargill is into it, so big meat firms. Uh, and these are just the meat companies and big food with steaks in meat-free. This is not scotch mist. It is happening. All the big companies are in here. Five minutes to go. I've got to really sort of pick up now. But yeah. I started a little late. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so why, is it do, why are these things doing well? Why are people more interested in plant-based? Well, for, and it may be environment. It may be, um, it may be health. It may be uh, what, what, uh, personal health. It may be animal welfare. But actually, it's because increasingly you've got plant-based products which are really yummy. And they have, you know, these are new companies that have gone out in the marketplace. This is just an example from, you know, you think, hmm, I think I'll try that. Uh, same thing, uh, here we are with Tesco. You think, hmm, yeah, no, no need to have meat when you've got really interesting things apart from meat. And here we go, here's Unilever who bought the vegetarian butcher. And in the UK this year, They've taken the vegetarian butcher's products and they're putting Australia $15 million behind in promotion. You know, so this is real in the marketplace and in mature markets, it will give competition to meat. The good thing for you, if I look at your markets, they're emerging markets and that's where there's huge interest and growth in meat consumption. Look at the vegetarian butcher products. What the cluck? You know, it's sort of cool, isn't it? Irritatingly cool. Chickened out burgers, etc. Uh, and is it just, you know, but not in Australia where you eat so much meat that it defies imagination. I looked at Coles as October, I mean, this month's, I thought it was a vegan magazine. Vigo Night, Go Plant Based. They had a special on burgers this month, and it was vegetarian burger, vegan burger, mushroom burger. You know, where does it end? So the world is changing. We need to... So, what have we got for Brenda's tea? What do I mean by that? I would suggest, I'm, I'm not negative on this, but looking at our own markets, that look in your own families or your grandchildren's families and work out what proportion of them actually have a vegetarian in the family. And it's surprisingly high. And when they go to put a tea on the table, they're going to say, well, what have you got for Brenda? Because Brenda's veggie at the moment. You know, or Ben, you know, I don't want to be sexist. So, you know, but it, it's real. It is real. It may be more urban than rural, but it's real, I would suggest. Tesco in trouble. I don't, Daddy, I don't want to eat animals anymore. Tesco advert, like our biggest uh, retailer. Uh, but perhaps we can all go for insects. Insect burger. Probably not, but what the insects will be, it'll be a big deal for protein to be fed to intensive livestock. And I put down the bottom, I wonder, let's fast forward 10 years, if, uh, you know, you're not short of flies in northern Queensland and the top end. This may be a real opportunity for you here. But you've just got to put them in a small room. Remember that, you know, you don't have to wait nine months for them to have a baby. They can have about half a million in a long weekend. <laughs> and then feed them. It's a very efficient way. It's coming our way. Hang on, I'm, the, I'm running out. Seriously, if you if you allow me five minutes, can I give me five minutes? This is a, a, a bit sort of look. Here, if you look around the world, a proportion of people are eco-active. What does that mean? They're interested in green-related issues, and they change their purchase behaviour to reflect this. What the research shows is that it's income-related. So, for example, down the bottom there, you've got Indonesia. You know, they're not so sort of nasty people. They're just relatively low income. And so the issue for them is getting enough money to buy, to an improved diet. And they'll think about the environmental issues later when they've got more of an income. Move up the, the, uh, the curve, you're into Sweden, Denmark, Austria, Germany, etc., where you can see people actively taking different purchase decisions based on their view of the impact on the environment and other related green issues. All I see is that's growing worldwide. And as countries increase 
their uh, per capita incomes, their household incomes, then people become more discerning, perhaps, or they take different decisions. And so we've got to look at those sort of animal welfare related, we've got to look at the environmental related, we've got to look at the human health, say, and you know, how are we positioned in this regard. Excuse me a minute. And so what I see here is, again, this happens to be in higher income countries, these social issues. I was in Lille in France talking at the Global Roundtable on Sustainable Soy, and here's the, we all know the panda. Don't get in the panda's way. If she doesn't like you, she'll give you a good battering. And what she wants people to do is when they go to KFC, for example, is to say to the person serving the chicken, excuse me, who produced the chicken? How did they produce it? What did they feed it? Did the soy come from Brazil? Did it destroy the Amazon, etc.? And so, I mean, it's these social pressures starting to dictate choice. And I'm saying, remind me again what I can't eat. Anything with palm oil. That's so unfair to Indonesia, but it's not a fair world, and it's not to do with science necessarily. Chicken that's been fed soy, cattle that's been shipped overseas. No, I won't because it doesn't have to be science-based. Seafood that despoiled disp mangrove, milk from herds where the calves are taken from mums early. You know, as consumers start to learn more about food production, they say, you do what? I mean, you take the male calves from the mummies when they were just born? That's barbaric. You know, so it's these views. <laughs> You've got to take them into account. Pork from hogs contained in, you know, anything with GMOs. It's these social pressures. And so back to my thing about, are we all going vegetarian or is it the end of meat as we know it? What amazes me is that normally sensible, and they may still be sensible, banks, Swiss banks are saying, look, this plant-based stuff's going to be mega. But remember that the meat industry global is super mega. If the global meat industry is a trillion, then plant-based products, which we read about all the time, the only issue is what percentage of that market will it take? Because it will take a proportion. But will it take 2% or will it take 20%? Almost done. Because if you take the extremes, here they are, a think tank predicts beef and dairy will collapse in 11 years. Do I think that? No. But there are those that do. And so I've got this sort of continuum where I think on the green side, that's plain sailing. Plant-based foods, passing fad, animal welfare activists shoot themselves in the foot as welfare performance improves, which you've been doing really well, and you've got to just keep at it. That's on the left, uh, on, is it my left-hand side? On the right-hand side, it's the jigs up. You guys, you know, Move to Melbourne, Brisbane, you know, it's all over. That's it. Meat industry collapses, live exports banned, social license to produce revoked, etc. And so we've got to decide where on that continuum might we be in 10, 20 years. And, you know, and it's not known. Where would I think we are? We're not going to be on the right-hand side, and we're not going to be on the left-hand side. It'll be somewhere. But will it be in the middle, or will it be more to green or red? And I think it's going to be... Where we'll be will depend on your own actions, I think. That, you know, the more proactive you are with regard to some of these big issues, as I mentioned, on the environment, on animal welfare, on human health, the more likely you are to gain credibility and trust with consumers, because that's what it's about. But remember, for them, it's not about science. It tends to be about emotion. And that's my lot. Thank you. <laughs>